Hey everyone, it's me, just Josh, and today I have an amazing show for you. Recently I sat down with Michael Greif, the director of the Broadway and now off-Broadway musical sensation Rent. I also get a sneak peek into the most unique show here in New York City, Arius with a Twist. But first up, I sit down with Brit pop star, the stunningly beautiful and golden voice Natalia Kills. So take a look. Hey everyone, Josh here, and I'm in the studio today with the amazing Natalia Kills, and she's taking time out of her crazy insane schedule to sit down with me and talk about her latest album, Perfectionist, the single Kill My Boyfriend, her tour, and everything else that she's got going. So thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for having me. Oh, and by the way, happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> it is a happy birthday. I'm happy to be here. So uh, let's talk about the album. Tell us a little bit about what we could expect when we listen to it. My album's called Perfectionist, mostly because as I was writing my songs, I realized that I was such a perfectionist. In my defense, I think that we're all perfectionists. Everything we do, we're looking and hoping for the best, whether it's the best job or the best lover or just the best of a bad situation. <laughs> And people have described my music as dark pop, mm -hmm. but I would prefer to describe it as pop with an opinion or a kill your ex-boyfriend pop. Which I told you I can absolutely relate to the title of the song. And the song is great, by the way. Thank so. you. And was there something behind it that inspired you to write that song? I wanted to translate how happily deranged love can be. I'm sure it might vary from person to person, but I definitely think that you become horrifically irrational when you're deeply and madly in love and willing to do anything for somebody. It would be better sometimes just to, you know. <laughs> just kill them. Yeah. I, I felt that way many a time. And when you're writing songs, not just uh, Kill My Boyfriend, but songs for the album, for example, does it start with the idea of like, God, I have this great idea for a song? Or I mean, what's your process like? I literally write all of my songs off of personal experience or even just opinions. The things I think about when I'm left to my own thoughts, you know, when you're stuck at a traffic light or lying awake at night trying to sleep. It's literally just me being me. But I try and be as direct as possible rather than being like, Ooh, baby, I'm so sad. <laughs> it really hurts inside. That's my bad singing voice, by the way. But rather than being like that, you know, I'd rather just be like, you're a dick. And are there people who you feel like, not necessarily that you emulate their style, but who write in a similar way that you could like... Yes, I do. I definitely feel like I can draw reference from the people I admire in music, especially Alanis Morissette. I've been a huge fan. It was the first album I actually bought, and just the way she writes her songs. It's so direct, and yeah, it is often like slightly psychotic, but that is the truth. I don't understand why, if me personally, if I could scream at a girlfriend, you know, why doesn't he love me? I do anything, blah, 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 blah. I'm gonna key his car and I'm gonna smash this, and oh my God, I just wanna be with him. Like, you know, it's many emotions all in one. I don't understand why if I can be that deranged in conversation, I should hide it when it comes to music because it would just be totally dishonest. I got some money in my pocket and I wanna go shopping. My single at the moment is Free featuring Will I Am. It's produced by Jeff Basker. It's one of my favorite songs on the album. And I really, really do feel inspired by Kate Bush because her music is uplifting and it's dramatic, but it's very honest. It's like she writes in stream of consciousness. Whatever comes to her mind goes straight to the page and onto the microphone. I feel a strong connection and definitely feel inspired by her as well. And when you go into um, into the studio to produce, do you, do you have a, actually a, a preference to record or to perform? I like recording. Uh, performing's fantastic because you can literally uh, reach out and touch 
the people that relate to you the most, all of the other psychotic little 17 year old girls out there who are just waiting to bloom into another me. It's so amazing for me to grow up from being a heartbroken 17 year old wanting to jump off a bridge because I was in love with somebody and then see those faces staring at me just a few years later going, yes, this is my identity and I really connect with everything and it's okay, I don't have to hide it, it's not a shameful thing and it's lovely. But I love recording because I love writing. I started as a songwriter for film and for other people and uh, it's such a privilege to be able to write my own album. Let's not forget that you do get to step out on stage still in front of tens of thousands of people. Though. I know, it's wild. I recently um, went on tour and I opened for the Black Eyed Peas for their stadium tour in Europe and there were 85,000 people there. And I was like, ah! That's, I can't even imagine what that's like. But it's great, it was wonderful. Everyone was singing along to my song, Mirrors. It was a really nice experience. And who do you have an audience in mind when you write and sing? Like, do you think, like, you know, I'm speaking to these young women or I'm speaking to this generation? I don't write for an audience. I write about my life and about my opinions. I suppose I'm writing for myself. It's cheaper than therapy. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> I believe that my audience are only people who have things in common with me, people who want everything to be right when everything's going wrong, who can find perfection when everything's destroyed. This kind of insane ambition and passion mixed with a battle of trying not to destroy yourself getting to where you want to be. If you had to choose one person to sing a duet with, who would it be? It would actually be Kanye West. All right. I love him. He's a self-proclaimed genius, and I, <laughs> I fully believe in it. I think I think he and is. I believe him. <laughs> I do. He's convinced me. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming and talking to us. And please, please, I know that there's a sort of possible move in your future. So when you come back to the city, please come back and see us. I like, will. It's, it's been such a pleasure. And you know, in my introduction, I, I, I refer to you as the amazing and like I, I that was basing that on the things that I only knew about you on paper and in the music but like sitting here talking to you it's it's truly you are amazing and I just wish you the best of luck and good luck back out on the tour and with the album it's called Perfectionist and you can buy it everywhere that you buy um, buy your records at iTunes and all that stuff so good luck with it and thanks so much thank you You know that I love the Broadways. And every decade or so, a musical comes along to define a generation. And in the 90s, that musical was Rent. So recently, I sat down with director Michael Greif to discuss the new production that is now running off-Broadway to see how he reconceptualized the show for a modern audience. So watch this. 525,600 minutes, how do you measure Today I'm in the studio with one of Broadway's finest directors. His name is Michael Greif and you might know him from such shows as Rent, Next to Normal or The Incredible Grey Garden. So it's such an honor to have him sitting here. So let's get to it and see what this is all about. Thanks so much for coming down and chatting with us today. It's a pleasure, Josh. Let's start off with um, the current production of Rent because it's now running here at New World Stages. What was the impetus behind remounting a production of Rent here in 2011? Uh, the invitation, really. Once Rent was off the boards, I thought about what it might be like to have the opportunity to do it again. And as I heard about a lot of other productions <laughs> in high schools and colleges and around the country, I thought, well, that's a wonderful thing to be able to get at that material. And I thought, what would I do if I had the opportunity to get at that material? Jeffrey Seller called to say that he and Kevin McCollum and Alan Gordon were interested, in fact, 
in remounting in New York production. And, uh, and I said that I would be, especially if they could imagine a new physical production and some new ideas around the show. And Jeffrey immediately was very responsive and excited about that possibility. And what would you say are the biggest differences between the original production and the current one playing now? Uh, the, the biggest differences uh, are in the, the setting. Physical production is completely different. The lighting is different. Costumes, although by the same designer, are sometimes different. Mark's filmmaking is a little bit more a part of the production than it was before. I love the production, uh, original as well as the current, and, and I have to say, um, you know, you're right, the physical production of this, this incarnation is, is really quite lovely, and there's something about the actual scale yeah. of it I found to sort of increase the intensity of the story. I think that's great. It always works best when it's really busting out, you know, when it's constrained in some way. You know, it certainly had that at the workshop. Mm -hmm. The Needlander was a fantastic home for it, don't get me wrong, I was really thrilled with that <laughs> long run. But it is great to see it, you know, where it does feel like, you know, it's blasting through the, the, the back wall of the theater. What audience were you having in mind for this, this yeah. around? With my knowledge of young people's love of the show, this was really made for really young people who maybe were going to start loving the musical theater and this was an introduction and a way of seeing themselves, a way of seeing, you know, a group of friends become a family at a time when I think a lot of young people are finding their own families and feeling particularly alienated from their own families or the need to alienate themselves from families and forming families of friends. So. You also recently, within the last year, um, directed a revival of the amazing and seminal piece, Angels in America. And similarly, it's set in a very specific yes. time and, and in, in its own way, you know, if not more so, has like the same sort of, you know, sort of huge international, like sort of recognition of a rent. Again, I look at something like Angels in America and it's kind of simultaneously a director's dream job and director's nightmare. How did you sort of go into it knowing like, oh, there was all this legacy around it and yet you had to approach this like eight and a half hour piece? Well, and... I met Tony in the late 80s. I mean, we both worked at the New York Theatre Workshop together and really always wanted to direct that piece and I just needed to wait 22 years to do it. <laughs> um, in terms of how do you prepare, in that, in that case, I thought that our setting informed an enormous amount about the production. You know, our setting at the Signature Theater, mm -hmm. which is a very intimate house with, you know, I, I think very apparent and obvious physical limitations. And there were also budgetary restrictions. I certainly approached it as, how do I make the most intimate and uh, bare bones production that I could make? And that's how it started being conceived with uh, Mark Wendland, the designer of both the New Rent and and uh, Angels in America. And what about it, like, it just uh, as far as it being like a very specific time, time. and place? Like, do well, you- Well, it was, it was necessary to educate the incredibly talented and young company. You know, real education in what the city felt like, what the world felt like, what these lives felt like. Tony was an enormous, enormous resource in terms of act, you know, actual events that inspired events in the play, so. And do you think that, like, I mean, because the play was such a call to action. It was such a, in a, yeah. I hate to use the word political, but it was a political piece Absolutely. in and of its, in its many other things too. And do you think that like, because a lot of conversations now do um, sort of center around the idea that like, oh, we're sort of taking a lot of emphasis and energy out of this drive towards, you know, uh, finding the cure, finding the treatments. Do you think that this still, in its way sort of had that impact. Do you think people were listening in a, in, in a similar way? No, I think they were listening in different ways. I mean, I, I think that the illness that is plaguing the planet was more at the forefront than the AIDS epidemic in, this, in, in our time. This is certainly true of me and other people meeting the play again. We were all struck with how unbelievably prescient Tony was and is uh, not only about the AIDS plague, but about so many other illnesses, you know, which we, we are now more in the midst of than perhaps they were in the early 90s. I, I certainly hope that one doesn't replace the other, 
and that no one becomes complacent or feels like they can be complacent because people are living longer uh, with AIDS. But I do think that other ills really did come to the forefront in the revival, and it's, it wasn't a plan. I think I saw several early productions, you know, one at, at the, the taper, taper yes. and then certainly the Broadway production of it, and then obviously the Mike Nichols film, and, and I was actually, again, in a similar way to Ren, struck at like how it just sort of lands back on earth and you know I mean I'm on the opposite side of it I mean before like when Rent opened or, or Angels opened I mean I was sort of on that young sort of the right. kids side and now I'm on that side like you were saying it's like teaching these young kids like this is what it was about this is what it was like and this is why you have to pay attention. Uh -huh. With all the work you've done, like you said, you mentioned, you know, you've done a lot of Shakespeare and you've done Chekhov and you've done musicals and non-musicals. Do you have a moment where you can say this was something a unexpected or like a highlight of your your amazing career, or is it just like, do you ever look back and just like, <laughs> how the fuck did this happen? Yeah, there's a lot of how the fuck did this happen because a lot of it is alchemical and a lot of it is combination and a lot of it. You do your best to put the right things together and sometimes you succeed more than others. I sort of love it a lot when you actually fall more in love with a piece as you work on it. Do you know those are the best experiences where play reveals itself to you as you're working on it and surprises you as you're working on it. And even though, you know, I was attracted to it and I loved it, I then, you know, found greater respect for it as, as I worked on it. Well, thank you, and congratulations on everything. And the show is Rent at the New World Stages, and it is so worth seeing. If you, even if you've seen it before and you think you've seen it, please go again. And again, thank you so much for coming in. And needless to say, the show is as sensational as ever, so I highly, highly recommend it. Speaking of sensational shows, I recently went down to the Lower East Side to the Abrams Art Center to sit down with two of my dearest friends and New York legends, Joey Arias and Basil Twist, to talk about their new show, the supersized version of Arias with a Twist. So take a look. Hey everyone, I am down at the Abrams Art Center here on the Lower East Side in New York City talking with two of my very favorite people in the entire world. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is why I do this show. To my right is the living legend, Joey Arias. And on my left is the incomparably brilliant puppeteer, Basil Twist. And together, they have put together a show unlike anything you have ever seen called Arias with a Twist. And it is stunning and it is beautiful and it is amazing. First of all, you've done Arias with a Twist before. What made you decide to actually, hey, let's bring it back again and, and put it in this beautiful, large theater? People wanted to still see it. People kept asking about it. When are you bringing it back? And then this, this fabulous theater was offered to us. It is beautiful, and I, I'm so happy that it came back, because I know you guys have been out on the road touring all yes, over the world, actually. Definitely. With it. Were there any places on your tour that, like, sort of stand out, you're like, oh, I love playing this city in particular. I know that we can't sort of, you know, we're, we love all the cities. All of them, we love them all, yes. But was there one where you were just like, wow, this show just sort of landed in an unexpected way? For me, I mean, they were all great, but Sweden was amazing. Even if I moved like this way, they were like, wah! <laughs> and if I crossed my legs, they were like, and I was, I, I got, oh, I'm gonna have fun. It was like a standing ovation right at the beginning of the show, and I thought, the right in the palm of my hand. Why did you guys actually come together to do the show? How did that happen? There was a cancellation in the little theater that mm -hmm. I run at here, and I had to fill it with something good fast. It was great, but it was funny because we actually did the Mal magazine party. Yeah. I was in town for a couple of days, and they were having a fashion thing, and he said, can you do something? And I'm like, oh, what are you doing? And Basil and I talked, he said, why don't we just put a little puppet show on? These are the puppets that belong, these antique puppets that belong to my grandfather right. that are in the show. And for the longest time, every time I go see Basil's shows, you go downstairs and they're in display, and I don't, but Basil, can we work with him? He keeps saying, no, they're antique, we can't, they're brown, they got, we're never gonna work with them. And in the back don't of my- Don't look at them. In the back, don't, yes, yeah, and you at the back- You say marionette. I was like burning candles, like, <laughs> you're gonna work with us, you're gonna let them out, they're gonna get out of that cage. And it was the first time we did it, and of course, everybody freaked out. As a puppeteer, how is it to work with someone who can actually talk back? He makes them come more alive. 
because he he actually believes in them so deeply. Like he actually sees the their soul. souls and relates to them and actually like belongs in this world under like kind of any other performer I've worked with. And how is it, I mean, you've worked with directors of all sorts, and how is it to work with someone who's used to just pulling strings and putting their hands in things? Well, I think Basil is beyond, just beyond pulling strings. He's, it's like, <laughs> this person's imagination just is beyond, beyond. I mean, just the stories and laughter and fun and that childlike spirit, that's basically what brings us together. It's, that, it's like finding that other friend in the playground and, and having fun together. That's, that's where it starts from, and that's where Basil comes from. We should mention that you do seven or eight shows a week. You're on stage, I would say, almost 90% of the time, if not yeah. even more. How do you actually like get through it? I mean, you're singing, you're moving around, you've got puppets that are turning you upside down, and you're in heels probably seven and a half inches and corseted in. And uh, I just take B12 shots every day. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. B B12. No, but yeah, right. No, but after doing Cirque du Soleil for all those years, this is different. It's like, it's, I could be doing this at home. But I do it to like stay in. I can't really go out. I've got to watch the boys. I need like a good 15 hours of no talking. And uh, it's just having fun. I feel lucky to come and have fun. Is there a point in the show where you're just like, oh, I just have to get past this part and then it's sort of downhill from there? It's not about downhill, it's about, there's like, a, there's sections. It's like when I land in the section by myself when all, when everything's in pitch blackness, mm -hmm. that's the next phase of the show. Mm -hmm. So it goes to me in two sections. And it's like, that's when I'm like, oh, okay, we got past that. And is there a moment in the show, sort of in the similar vein, where you're just like, I look forward to this moment more than anything else? I think, well, of course, the, the opening number, uh -huh. that is like, I'm just like, wait, because I know people are going to go, <clears throat> and probably, I don't know, the acid trip? What about you? Is there something, as you're sitting in the house, where you're just like, waiting for this one moment to come up that you love so much? I love it when Joey turns into the octopus and all the tentacles come out. It's always pretty great. Yeah. That's like the real like melding of the two of us where actually Joey becomes a puppet. When that magic happens, I could feel it happening. Basil, you have worked in so many different mediums. You know, obviously uh, one of the sort of biggest departures being Symphony Fantastique. Mm. What do you use and what do you call upon for inspiration for these amazing pieces of art that you come up with? They're all so different and a lot of times it's music and in this case it's my collaborator and it was a space. I mean I like I get inspired by a space and what a space is like. Like how did you come up with what you're wearing because it's very specific your look in this show. Of course you know I work with Mugler, Manfred Tier Mugler for years. We met in 1980 and we actually started professionally working together in 1990 with the George Michael video and he just said you, you become my drawing. You, and you just do what I say. You're not even asking questions. You just go with it. I love it. And we started playing that way. So I happened to have a, an extra corset from the show that was flesh colored. And so uh, Chris March made. And, and so he goes, what do you think? I said, I, I want to be naked. Like, like oh, great, great idea. So then he came to, to New York and came to see Basil and came to the studio and was looking at the jungle. And they were talking and talking and talking. And he just started sketching. And he said, he wants that little veil bikini, and of course he wants the silhouette. And we have actually a brand new, a new, new dress. dress. Oh, wow. This is the dress that actually belongs in the show. It's downstairs, and he, there's drawings, and people wanted to see them, but he was new, cannot show those drawings, because those drawings are probably worth a million dollars right, right. for the fashion business. They see one thing with the, the how to use it, right. and all, how do they take it apart, and it's like, forget it. He was, you know, it's like a new silhouette he's working with, and I'm premiering it here. That's amazing. A brand That's new amazing. silhouette by Manfred Mugler, yeah. You've been around for several years in the New York scene. Yeah. Um, do you ever look around and you're just like, how the fuck did I end up? Like, you know, you, from those moments where you landed here from Los Angeles, working at Feirucci, being with Klaus, and I mean, all the way through the 80s, into the Billie Holiday stuff, and now here. Like, do you ever look around and just like, how did this all happen? I do, every day. I'm like, how the hell did I do that? But you know, it's always been... I've always wanted something. Like, I always kept dreaming of David Bowie. I saw myself with Bowie. I always saw, I could see him talking to me. And when it happened, I was like, that's what I saw. You know, with Basil, I could see myself in the Basil show. It was there. 
But the other thing's just happened, but everything's been a wrong turn. <laughs> the right day. But a right turn. And when you have like these houses which are packed with people, because I've never seen either of your shows where there isn't just like a line out the door, what is the experience you're hoping to bring to the audience? We want to inspire people. We want to enchant people and transport them and inspire them with something completely outrageous and creative and exciting and take them to another world and just that people leave like inspired on fire. I, as an audience member who has seen the show several times, mm -hmm. I can say you absolutely delivered that a hundredfold. Thank you guys so much. I know you've got a lot of work to do, so I really appreciate you sitting down with me today and talking, and I love you both so much and wish you the best of luck with the show. You, and let me just say, it's Arius with a twist. Please do not miss it. If it comes to a town near you or check it out online, please, Arius with a twist, one of the most amazing things I, I have ever seen in my life, and I, I promise you will agree. Well, what did I tell you? Pretty amazing stuff, right? I'd like to thank my guests today, Natalia Kills, Joey Arias, Basil Twist, and of course, Michael Greif. And remember, if you want to write to me or just say hi, you can reach me at justjosh at heartv.com. That's justjosh at heartv.com. And as always, thanks for tuning in. And remember, don't be a drag, just be a queen. And remember, ah! and we'll talk to you at, ugh, sorry, good God, sorry, voicemails, tuning in, God damn it. So as most of you know, I'm a single guy living in the city, trying to work it out. And I've been dating lately, but I've also got this minor pet peeve about these guys who spend most of the time on these dates either on their phone, checking Facebook or Grindr or their voicemails. I just don't understand the etiquette. Generally, when I go in for a date, I turn my phone off, put it in my pocket, and I'll check it at the end. But these guys literally will put it on their table and every five minutes, it kind of gives me a, a, an uneasy feeling. Can, can anybody relate to this? Anyway, I, I hate it. I think it's really rude. And it generally will turn me right off and that will be the end of that. So guys, turn your cell phones off, sit back, relax, and enjoy the day. Just say it. It is ridiculous.